Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, I'm sure you've had a very busy day um, at school and uh, this is probably the last thing you want to do at this time as it's getting dark. Um, but here we are and we'll try and um, get through this um, as quickly as he, and easily as, and as clearly as possible. So my name's Claire Sis. Um, I'll just introduce myself before we start. I've been um, working with Pearson for around six years now. Um, my background is that I was um, a nursery nurse, as it was back in the day. I actually studied at BTEC as a 16-year-old and went into the wonderful world of childcare and continued um, working in that sector um, for many, many years. And then I became a teacher and I taught um, various childcare qualifications. And then um, I became a peace and associate. So at the moment, I have been a standard verifier. I've, I've been an examiner on some of the exam papers. Um, if you've delivered the 2017 version of the qualification, um, you may recognize my name because I was actually fortunate enough um, to be offered the wonderful opportunity to write a chapter of that textbook. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing lots of training for um, Pearson on the New Tech Awards. I've actually been um, given the opportunity to be a moderator um, on this qualification as well. And I am also working as a quality nominee in, in a college, which is my full time day job. And I'm based in West Yorkshire, um, not too far from Leeds. And the weather is absolutely dreadful, um, raining um, and getting dark. So um, before we carry on, I'm just going to do like a little bit of housekeeping. So um, I always start the session by saying, obviously, we are training over the Internet and it can be a little bit unpredictable. Hopefully, we're not going to have any technical issues. Um, but I always like to just warn people about that just in case. If you're having any issues and you can't hear or um, you get sort of thrown out of the room or anything like that, um, we're not expecting anything like that to happen, but you never know. The easiest way to fix it is to come, go back into the <clears throat> Zoom link um, or sometimes shutting down your laptop, restarting and going back into the link um, can fix the problem. But we're very fortunate to have Joffrey um, online today as technical support. So if there's any issues, hopefully he may be able to help. Um, he's already mentioned that this event will be recorded. And the reason for that is that we have to record all our events because it's an off-call requirement. You will not be identified on the recording and the chat box will not be shown um, on the recording. And also one of the events, um, I'm not sure which one because I've delivered a few of these now, but one of the recordings is uploaded to the website so that people who haven't been able to make an event can um, listen back to that. All the materials that I'm going to share with you today, except the PowerPoint, are available on the website. And at the end of the um, two hours, I will do a quick tour of the website just to show you all where you can find everything, just in case um, you're not clear about that. The PowerPoint will be sent to you. If you haven't got it already, it should arrive um, within the next couple of days. And there's going to be opportunities for you um, this afternoon to ask questions. Um, just be aware that I am um, by myself this evening as a trainer. Sometimes on these events, we have a second trainer in the background who answers the questions on the chat. And we don't have anybody um, to do that this evening. So if I could ask you if you could wait, um, try and wait till near the end for your questions, because often, you know what it's like, you ask a question, but I'm going to actually going to cover that um, on another slide. But I will keep pausing every few slides just to keep my own on the on the on the chat box to see if there's anything coming in. Um, in the event of, um, you know, just in case there was a question that I wasn't able to answer this evening, I would um, keep a note of that and I would get an answer to you um, within the next couple of days. Um, we would like you, if possible, to keep your microphones and your cameras off um, just because it improves um, the quality of the call. 
And the other thing I need to say is um, too much information, but I am suffering from a, a cold at the moment. Um, so if I feel like my voice is going or I need to mute um, for a, a minute, I'll just apologise in advance. Um, but I've got water beside me and I'm hoping um, that I'm not going to go into um, a, a, a coughing fit. So I do apologise if that happens. OK, so without further ado, I'm just going to um, share <clears throat> PowerPoint um, presentation with you. And hopefully you will be able to see this. OK, and we'll get going. So welcome. This is the BTEC Tech Award from 2022 for child development. And it's the marking and moderation event for the internally assessed components, which are component one and component two. So hopefully <coughs> this is the correct event that you thought you were going to be attending today. And on the slide now, you can see what the aims of the session are. So hopefully if you look at those, this is what you're expecting um, to come and learn about today. So we're going to be exploring the level based mark schemes for component one and component two. And we're going to be referring to the term best fit approach. Um, so hopefully by the end of the event, you will understand how to mark um, your students' work. We're going to look at the Pearson set assignments and also some <clears throat> examples, um, the exemplar standardisation material, which is actually some pieces of work um, that we have provided for you. Um, and there's the top, middle and a bottom mark. And those are on the website, but we're going to have a look at those together and going to show you what marks they've been awarded and how those marks are, have been given. We're going to cover, um, take you on a complete walkthrough of the whole moderation process. So what happens from the learners doing the work to you marking it, to it going to the moderator, to awards and grading and results and review of moderation. So we're going to be taking you the whole way through that process. And in and amongst that, we're going to be talking about key dates that you're going to need to be aware of um, within your centres. And we're also going to celebrate. <clears throat> I always say that because it's um, such fantastic news. This, we're going to celebrate the reduction in admin and paperwork um, it com in comparison to the 2017 qualification um, because that's going to be a very um, welcome change um, to everybody um, because you're all so busy um, and it really does cut down your workload quite significantly. Then at the end, I'm going to be just talking about further support. So where you can go if you need more information, how you can apply to be a moderator yourself, because some of you may want to do that. And we do have some vacancies available. And as I said, I will end with a quick tour of the website and um, just to show you where everything is and make sure that everybody is clear and um, where they can find out everything. So before I move on, I'm just going to... Um, have a quick look in the chat. I could see a couple of things. Kimberly was saying that she couldn't see the PowerPoint, but other people are saying they can. If you can't see the PowerPoint, um, I'm not sure what the problem is. I think perhaps logging back out and logging back in might fix the problem. Um, but if you're still having a problem, just put something in the chat and we'll sort of see what we can do. <clears throat> Okay, so we've just got some information to start us off about applying the marking grids, and then we're going to go through and be looking at this in a lot more depth. When you actually receive these PowerPoint slides, some of them have a link on there, um, and this one has a link at the bottom to a video. So um, <laughs> Pearson have produced a number of very short YouTube videos that are really quite helpful. Um, and you may want to revisit those after the training. And they're literally sort of two, three or four minutes long. Um, quick refreshes. To, and there's one about applying the level-based mark scheme. 
So what we've now got on this qualification, we are no longer grading pieces of work with a pass, merit or distinction. So there are no criteria anymore. And if you delivered this qualification in its previous um in the previous form, the 2017 format, you will know that when you marked it, you were give, deciding if particular criteria were met. So you were looking at has the student met their level one P's or, and then their level two P's and their merits and distinctions. That's now all gone. And when you are marking, you are now giving learners a numerical mark. So each component, you will be marked out of 60 and you will mark it by using a 12 mark per grid and a 3 mark per band structure, which we're going to be looking at in lots of depth this afternoon. This is welcome news because it means that the qualification is now compensatory. So it's much fairer for the learners um, because the nature of applying marks rather than grades um, really does benefit the students. So they can have a high performance against some skills and task, tasks and a weaker performance in others, but they take the total marks forward towards the qualification outcome rather than taking away a path for a component where they had a mixture of P, M's and D's. So in the legacy um, 2017 qualification, you'll be aware that if a student had, say they'd met um, some of the P criteria, but not all of them, they could have met some of the P's, some of the M's and some of the D's, but they'd end up with a pass because they hadn't met all of the P's. And that you know, is is a little bit unfair, and it doesn't take into account their, um, you know, the good work that they've done, um, and it doesn't balance out sort of the the good bits with the weak bits. So this way, it's a much fairer way um, of grading the grading the qualification. It's very important that we are using the descriptors um, when we're marking and the marks available. So we talk to learners about their mark, how many marks they've got out of 60. And we also talk to them about bands. So their, their um, work might be in band one, which is, is at the lower end of the spectrum, and it goes all the way up to band four. What we absolutely must not do, and this is going to be quite difficult and it is a big change if you've done the previous qualification we must not under any circumstances talk to learners about p m's and d's so if a student does very well because because the components are out of 60 and let's say they get 60 out of 60 or they get 58 or something like that you must not say to them this is probably a distinction um, because you will not know what those grade boundaries are until moderation has taken place. And moderation takes place in a window a little bit like exams. So I'm going to be covering that in much more detail um, later on, but it's very, very important that we don't talk about um, grades. The other thing that you will need to do, which is not a massive job, but when your learners have um, completed their work and you've marked it, you will need to put them in rank order. So the learner who's got the highest mark will be at the top and the learner with the lowest mark will be at the bottom. And there's lots of reasons why you need to do that. And I'm going to talk about those as we go through the presentation, if that's OK, because they do come up at quite um, it's at certain points this afternoon. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, so shortly I'm going to be introducing you to the example standardization materials. So what you get here, um, and some of you may have already looked at these on the website because they have been available for some time. For each component, we've given you a top, middle, and a bottom piece of work. And please be aware that these pieces of work at the moment have not been written by students. They have been written by Pearson um, Associates because we don't have any real work yet until we've gone through the qualification. 
but they've been written and they've been marked and the principal moderator has given the marks and has given quite a lot of detailed commentary about why these pieces of work were given the mark that they were given. So these will be very, very useful to you. Um, and they are intended to be used for what we call internal standardization. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, one of the, you know, I did say we were going to celebrate the reduction in paperwork on this qualification. But one of the things we will celebrate is that there is no longer a requirement for you to do any internal um, verification within your centre. However, and, and, and there's actually no um, requirement for you to do any official standardisation where you have to register as lead IV and go on to Ed Excel online and tick a box. However, what we are providing is these materials that you can have a look at to help you to understand how the marks are being applied. So the purpose of them is to be used for internal standardization. And you may want to use them at the beginning of your, um, before you start your marking. But you may also want to dip into them throughout the year as well. They are, they are not designed to be used as templates. So please do not look at them and think, oh, you know, this is how my learners must set out the work. That's not what they're designed to be used for, and they should not be given out to the students. They are for you to help you to, to, to sort of remind you of how the marks are being applied. So that when you come to marking, if you're marking a piece of work and you're thinking, I'm not really sure I'm putting this in the right mark band, you can go back to what a high mark band one or a low or a medium mark band one looks like and it can just help you to compare and help you to make sure that you're um, applying those marks correctly. So just to recap, there's no longer a requirement for anybody on this qualification to register as a lead IV, that's gone. There's no longer a requirement for you to um, complete any official standardisation where you have to um, log that on Edexcel Online. Um, however, it is in your best interest to do this unofficial standardisation where you actually um, if, if you are what I call um, a one-man or a one-woman band, where you're just teaching this qualification on your own, you may want to pair up with somebody who's teaching sport or um, health and social care or something else in your centre, just to have a look at these together. And you can do, even though I said there's no requirement for internal verification, if you wanted to do something formal, if you wanted a colleague to have a look at your marking to see what they think. Absolutely, you can do that and you do not need to log, record it. But, you know, some of you may want to do that. So I'll leave that up to you. As I said, as we move forward into the future, after we have a year through on this qualification, we will end up with some real work that we will be able to put on there on the website. And the same applies with exams, really. So if you know, like as, as each exam series takes place, we, we upload the exam paper and we upload the lead examiner's comments. That will happen with the internal components. So every year, more examples will appear on there and you'll have different ones that you can use um, for your standardisation. So I hope um, that that makes sense. Okay, I'm just going to pause briefly just to check with anything, any question. No, we don't seem to have any questions coming up at the moment. So what I'm going to share with you now is um, we're going to start with component one. Um, and I'm just going to share with you an example of the Pearson set assignment for component one and have a look at the mark grid. And then we're eventually going to go on and have a look at the exemplar standardisation. So if you just give me a second to um, switch onto a different screen.
I'm sure that didn't work because I'm back to the one that I was on. Sorry, try again. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. Um, okay, so this is an example of a Pearson set assignment for component one, and this has been on their website for quite some time. Um, so hopefully you've seen this and, you, and you've had a look at it. So just to be clear, um, you now must use for component one and two, the Pearson set assignment. You are not allowed to change this in any way. The only thing that you can change on it is the date um, because it depends on when you're going to do it in your centre as, as to when it's going to be completed. And you can also um, put the learner's name on it if they're having one of these each. Nothing else on here can be changed. So in the past, on the 2017 qualification, you were allowed to add, um, adjust those assignment briefs or you could actually not use them and write your own if that's what you wanted to do. That's now gone. So you have to use the, the, the right one. And you have to use the one that is designed for the window that your learners have been entered into. So it's a little bit like an exam. It will not be the exact same um, assignment every time however the format will be the same and it will be similar but it will be things like the age groups that change and I'll go through this um, and explain it as I go through it <clears throat> so it will be set out with the qualification and everything at the top um, the completion time for the assignment is approximately six hours and that can be um, divided up however you like. You, they could do it in a whole six hours if you really wanted them to. I'm not sure I would be going down that road, but or they could do it in two, three hour blocks or three, two hour blocks, however you want to do it. So what you get is a vocational context and you get a series of tasks. So I'm whizzing up and down on here, but I'm going to come back to it. So you can see there we've got task one, task two, and, and task three. And for each task, the learners will be given some information and then they will be given um, a checklist of evidence of what they're actually supposed to produce. So on this one, um, obviously not going to read all this out to you, but it tells us about Billy, who is six months old, and what the students need to write about. And it's very important that um, you can see that Pearson have actually put Billy's age in bold um, because you know what some students are like and they might um, write about the wrong age group. And I've seen that myself many times. So they do um, make that very clear to them that this is the age group they're supposed to be looking at. And it's asking them to make a, a booklet um, about development and about growth. And he has some bullet points in here that are very clearly explaining what they have to include um, within that. And it tells them that it covers learning AMA and it gives them advice on what kind of evidence they could produce. So the checklist of evidence here, they're asking them to produce a, bookle a booklet, approximately five to six pages of A4, and that they can include images um, if they want to, and they should use headings to structure their work. <clears throat> now, we get lots of questions about this, so I'm going to try and cover everything if, if these are things that you've been worrying about. Um, do not get too worried about the number of pages and the size of font and things like that. It does say approximately five to six pages. They're just giving that as a bit of a guide. Obviously, it depends on how big the student's writing or font size is. Um, so please don't, don't get hung up on that and don't think that, you know, it must be six pages or if you go over and you've got 10 pages, that that will be a problem because it won't. Also, if you've got students who have additional needs or um, 
you know, uh, visual impairment, anything like that, and they need to do it on bigger paper or coloured paper or anything like that, that's absolutely fine. Um, students can handwrite their work if, if that's what you want to do, or they can um, word process their work. It does not matter either way. If they are word processing their work, you do have to um, disable the internet. And one of the questions that I am always asked is how come it says that they can include images if you've disabled the internet? And the answer to that is simply that you will have some wonderful people in your school. I am not one of those people who will understand how you can disable the internet but keep it open for images because I'm not an IT expert and apparently that can be done. They do not have to include images. It's just saying that they can if they want to do that. Um, and then what they get in, in an appendices with this um, particular example is some information about ages, uh, about milestones, which I'll, sh I'll show you um, at the end. Okay. I'm just going to pause because I think there's a question coming. Tony said, I didn't allow the students to use the internet, so there were no images. That's fine, Tony. They do not have to include images and they can do very well. You, they can get full marks without using images. It's just saying they may want to. Uh, so that's just a choice. Um, and then it gives you a little bit of guidance of Perhaps you may want to spend one hour on task one and task one is worth 12 marks. So this is not saying that, you know, you must spend an hour on task one. It's just giving that as an approximate guide. OK, and task one is out of 12 marks. Task two, again, I'm not going to read all this out to you, but you are given some information about what you have to do. And here they've highlighted particular areas of development. So they want physical and they want social. Again, this is very important because you've got the learners who go off and write about language and intellectual because they've not read it properly. So making sure they're very clear about what they're writing about. Because if they write about the wrong things, they won't get the marks. Um, and it's talking about a case study of Tasneem, which Tasneem is given at the back in the appendix. And they have to select four factors that impact on Tasneem's development. <clears throat> and again, it's saying four in, in bold. So if they only write about two or three, they're not going to get high marks. And this one is saying um, they would like them to write two written accounts of approximately five to seven pages of A4, and again, subheadings um, should be used. This one is out of 24 marks, um, and they are um, suggested that, th that this one will take them two and a half hours. Okay, and then task three has another case study at the back, which I'll, I'll show you. It was about Olivia. And this one is asking them to write about cognitive and emotional. So again, you've got those words in bold to remind them and you've got that they're writing about four factors um, again. And this one is out of 24 marks as well. And they are suggesting that the learners would spend 2.5 hours on task three. But again, that's just a guide. So this is the Pearson set assignment that was provided as an example. However, we are slap bang in the middle of the first opportunity that you could have to put your learners in for this component. So on the website at the moment, you can also see the Pearson set assignment for this window. And I'm not sure if any of you have already entered your learners for that window. I'm not sure we've had many entries across the country because obviously like it's a bit early so if you haven't entered your learners for that window you can you can go on have a look at that Pearson set assignment because it's on the website and it's available for everybody who has an edXL online account and um, so you can have a look and you can have a look at how that differs to this one and basically what I'm saying to you is 
they will be set out the same, but it's these things that, that will change the age groups, the areas for development, um, very much that what they have to sort of produce will roughly stay the same. And the mark grid that you will use when you're marking component one will not change um, depending on what year you are using it. So that one will stay the same, but it's very important that you give the learners the correct Pearson set assignment and you will have to um, enter them for the window. And we're going to be covering all that in a lot more depth later with the time scales and things like that. So I'm just going to pause for the questions. Um, Chris, uh, Christy, do they need to reference the images? It's good practice that they do, um, but they know, you know, they're not going to get penalised or, or anything for that. If the students are word processing, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Do I need to arrange a space on the school network that only they can access with my permission? Um, probably. Yeah, you probably would need to do that, Karen. And, and that's something that your exams officer and your IT people can help with. Um, I think you're probably sort of asking there as well about where they would save the work. So the logistics of saving it. And you all use different things in your schools. I know some of you use Google Classroom, some of you use um, OneDrive and things like that. So you would have to make sure that that's saved um, securely. Tony said, we have entered the learners because they did it, something in year nine. OK, that's fine. You may have entered them already. That's absolutely fine. And then someone was just giving, she, Tony was giving current advice on the different accounts. So thank you for that. You're giving each other advice. Um, which is really good but yes Tony many people start teaching this in year nine and they feel their students are ready and if you've put your learners in that's absolutely fine okay so the bit that I didn't show you was just the um I mean there's lots of guidance here that you can read um Bit I wanted to show you was the appendices, and I'll go back to Mark Grid in a minute. So um, these are the appendices that the learners have been referred to within that assignment. So here's the um, typical stages of development that they've been asked to have a look at. And then for task two, um, they were given the case studies of Tasneem and Olivia that's two and three as well. So it's worth going through these with the learners because I do keep saying this, but um, as an examiner, it's absolutely so destroying when you mark a student's piece of work and they've written something really good, but they've used the wrong age group. And whatever they've written is absolutely fantastic. But Tasneem is two and a half. So if they've written about a four-year-old or a three-month-old baby, it, they'll end up with with no marks. So it's worth going through this with them and getting them to highlight the age, drilling it into them that she's two and a half, and also highlighting some of the information it's giving them about the child. So this child goes through early years setting, where she lives, she's got asthma, etc. And the same with Olivia, you know, highlighting. That, so they're making sure they're going back to the case study because to get the full marks, to get into mark band four, they have to show they've really tuned in to that case study and they've really applied um, to this, this particular child and this particular child's um, circumstances. Okay, so just going back to the um, mark grids. You can see on the on the screen now, this is an example of the mark grid that you will be using for component one. And again, these will not change. These will be the same if you use them now or next year um, or in the next window. And again, I'm really not trying to patronise you, but these all look the same. So please do make sure that you're using the correct one because there's a different one for each task of each component and they all look roughly the same so at the top here you will see it clearly says component one and it says task one 
And as we go down, you've got a separate one for task two. And you've got um, a separate one for task three. So how this works, um, let's go back to task one. Okay, so you are marking your students' work and you will have this in front of you and you've marked their task one. And the first thing that you have to decide is which mark band you want to put it in. And that's the, um, it's the best thing to do is to make that decision first before you decide where it is in that mark band. And in order to help you with that, Pearson have used um, these words that are all in bold. And these are really helpful. Um, so we can see the difference here. So to be in Mark Band 1, they would show a limited knowledge. They would give a few milestones, a superficial account, little relevance, etc. And you can see um, uh, how those words are used. And then in the next Mark, Mark Band, we're moving up now to adequate. Some milestones partially detailed, partially developed. Then to get in Mark Band 3, it goes to good. They've covered most milestones, they've covered mostly detailed, um, it's mostly developed, and then all the way up to the highest mark band, which is comprehensive. They've included all the milestones, it's fully detailed, etc. So this is obviously your <clears throat> balloons taxonomy moving up, you know, the levels. And it's pretty much common sense. You know, you're all experienced teachers. And hopefully you will be able to um, use your professional judgment to decide whether something is limited, adequate, good or comprehensive. And you make the decision that you're putting something into a mark band. So let's say that I have been marking something and I've decided it's good and I want to put it in mark band three. Make that decision first. Then I have to decide, is it seven, eight or nine marks? So is it just in mark band three? Is it really good and it's perhaps borderline mark band four, which might take it up to nine? Or is it perhaps in the middle, which would be an eight? And the good news is that when this goes to your moderator, you don't need to worry about being slightly out. So if, if you put it in mark band three and you give it nine and I come along as your moderator and I think it's eight, that doesn't really matter because we're in the same band. But if you've given it nine and I'm saying actually it's two or it's 12, then we're in a different mark band and that's why where we might get a disagreement. And I'll talk to you much later about exactly what happens when that happens. So you're making those, those decisions. Um, sometimes it's not that straightforward. Um, and you may end up having to make what we call a best fit approach. So the example I've just given you, let's say the piece of work is pretty um, consistent all the way throughout. It's good all the way throughout. And it was quite easy to put it in that band because it ticked all those boxes. But sometimes marking isn't that straightforward, is it? You get a student who starts off really well, but then as the piece of work goes on, it gets a bit a, a, a bit poorer. Or you can get the opposite, where they don't start off very well and they get their mojo and it becomes much better as the piece of work gets towards the end. So you might end up with... Um, let me give you an example. So let's say this learner are marking their work and... They've covered most of the expected milestones, okay? So I'm going to say that that bit's good. However, as they go along, they have um, gone off on a bit of a tangent. They've started writing about the wrong thing. They've got all muddled up. And the, net, the end of it ends up with a simplistic reasoning. And there's a wonderful tracker I'm going to show you at the end where it helps you to do the best fit approach. It really is a fantastic tracker um, and I'll show you that at the end. But where you get that, you may have to average it out. So if you've got something up here where you're giving it an eight or a nine and you've got something down here where you're giving it a three, 
you might then be averaging the piece of work in the middle of the mark band two, which will be a five. Um, and it's using that best fit sort of common sense approach um, will help you to get it in the right place. And I'm going to talk to you about that much more as we go along. And then, so you get the idea. We get this uh, a second mark grid for task two. Again, similar words, limited, adequate, good, um, simplistic reasoning, partially developed, etc. And then we get the one from mark three for, for task three. So it's the same approach for each task, but it's a slightly different marking grid. Make your decision first about what mark band it goes in and then make your decision about how many marks you're giving it. And please do not be afraid to give something the full 12 marks. And I know that that can be, you can be a bit nervous about that, but always ask yourself, is it, what more would I have wanted them to do? And I feel that pain. And, and when I was doing my moderator training, we saw some work that was 12 marks. And I, I was giving it 11 because I just didn't want to give it that 12 because I just didn't dare do that. But please have the confidence to do that because you will have some learners who do get in that mark band for. And always ask yourself, what more would I expect them to do? And if the answer is nothing, then it's 12 marks. The opposite end of that is obviously giving them nothing. Um, it's very hard for a learner to get nothing. Um, what we've been finding, because um, I do actually do this qualification on health and social care as well, and we've already done some standardisation and looking at some of those. <clears throat> and what we've found is that um, often, even if they just write a sentence or two, we can usually find a mark. Um, they're only going to get nothing if they haven't written anything or they've written about completely the wrong thing. Um, so it's just a little word about that. So I'm going to move on next to looking at some examples of this work and looking at how it's been graded. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to go back to the chat because I don't want to um, leave all the questions to the end and then I end up um, losing any. Okay, hi Sharon. Do we annotate students' work to show which map and we have put them in? That's a really good question, Sharon. Um, I'm going to cover this, if you just bear with me, I am going to cover the marking and the annotation in a separate slide. So I haven't forgotten about that. I will come back to it. Um, Tony's asking, what if the final marks for task one covers mark band four, three and one? Do we go for the middle? Fantastic question, Tony. Yeah, you have to sort of average it out. But if you just wait till the end, I'm going to show you how this wonderful tracker can help you with that and um, which person has produced so I will come back to that that's right um Christy for the milestones they only need to talk about the ones that provided in the appendix yeah and this is a um yeah thanks Tony if they're just asking for physical or social I've been working on BTEX for many 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 years and one of the common myths that always came up on any level qualification was this myth that learners have to write about everything they've been taught about and that is not true this is like it's a bit like an exam so you teach them the whole of the component content and you teach them about physical social emotional language everything and every age group <clears throat> but when it comes to the task do they have to apply it so they're never going to be asked to write about absolutely everything. And they mustn't do that because they'll just waste their time. And um, they only need to write about what they're asked to write about. OK, thank you. OK, so hopefully you're ready to see this in practice now. And um, I will apologise because we don't have time in two hours to read through all this in lots of depth. So what you will need to do is go away and have a look at these yourselves. Um, sorry, I've got so many things open. Um, you need to have a look at these yourself and get your head around them. So I'm going to show you now 
um, the high mark component one. Oops, it's, I, I did warn you at the beginning about um, technical issues. It's not letting me open it, so I'm just going to do apologise. I thought I was being really organised and putting them ready on my desktop. So I'm just going to have to go and open it straight from the website. But this isn't a bad thing because it'll show you um, where to open them from. Um, Sorry about that, everyone. He's now going to ask me to put my panel word in. I don't know why that would not open from where I served it, but hopefully you're not going to have any problems if you try and do it. So fingers crossed this is going to work. Yes, it's working. I apologise about these. I mean, it isn't my doing, but they do all look the same. So they've all got the same picture of this young man with a child on the front. So if you're going to print them or anything, just make sure you know which one you're looking at. So on this contents page, it will tell you if it's the high mark, the low mark or the medium mark. And obviously at the front, it will tell you which component it's for. So this is an example of um, a learner who has done very, very well in this component on that Pearson set assignment that I've been showing you. And what you get here is um, the principal moderator has put some text in a red box where it will tell you what mark the learner was given um, and how many marks they were given for each task. And then further down, you get some things in a blue box. And the blue box is the principal moderator's commentary where she has told you exactly why that piece of work was given the mark that it was given. And then you also get something in a yellow box. And these are what we call top tips um, that will help you along the way with your marking. Um, so it's a really good idea to have a look at those as well. So I'm just going to go up. And again, we don't have time. And it would be very boring if I was going to read all this out to you. Um, so this one, this learner was got 56 out of 60. So they did very, very well. And on task one, they were given the full 12 marks because the moderator put this at the top of band four. So as you can see, um, you know, they've written quite a bit. I'm, I'm not going to read all this out to you, but I'll read some little bits of it. So it's structured very well. It's got a nice introduction. Billy is six months, and this is what I'm going to be writing about. They're writing about his... Um, communication development at the ages and stages of development, what he should be doing by now, because he's six months old, they say he should be cooing at adults, making babbling sounds, etc. That's quite detailed. Um, they show him that they really understand it's you know it's a comprehensive account of what Billy would be doing at six months old. They've then gone on to talk about the measurement of growth. They're really understanding how growth is measured. They're talking about centile charts. They're talking about girls and boys having different charts. They then go on to give a few images. So you can see here how images could be used effectively. However, they, you, they don't have to use them. But this learner has referred, has put the image in and then shown that he or she understands it by saying this is a chart and it shows that the child was 16 weeks old and how much they weighed. So they're really showing a very deep understanding there um, and they have referenced their image. And then again, you can see they've talked about the health visitor, what the parents do, and this is a very, very good piece of work. So hopefully, <clears throat> You will have some learners who are going to produce work of this quality, but I know that you may not have learners who produce work of this quality. <laughs> Excuse me, but um, obviously this is just showing you an example of that high mark. Excuse me a minute.
Sorry, everyone. I just had to pause to have a cough. Um, I do apologise. Okay, so in the blue box now, the moderator is telling us exactly why it was put in Mark Band 4. They've shown a comprehensive knowledge. It fully meets requirements. They've included all the milestones. It's a fully detailed account. And can you see how these words mirror those words from the Mark Grid? So fully detailed, comprehensive. And somebody obviously raised a question about that. When you're marking, can you write that in the annotation? And you can. And we're going to talk about that as we, as we move forward. Sorry, I was just struggling a little bit again there. And you've got the tips in the box. So if a learner's response meets the requirements of the descriptor fully, remember what I said, do not be afraid to give the full marks, okay? And then task two, which is 24 marks, they've actually got 22. They got 12 for learning aim A and they got 10 for learning aim B. I'm just flicking through that slowly. Again, I'm not expecting you to read it, but you can just see how much is there for it. Sorry, everyone, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm just um, struggling a little bit. So at the um, bottom of here, again, you've got the moderator's commentary, which tells you how um, those marks were applied. And then again, you've got some top tips. So again, we don't have time to go through all of this, but you get the idea. And you do need to read these carefully and they will be really, really helpful to you. In contrast to that, I'm just going to open up the um, low mark one. Luckily, that one's open straight away. Um, so again, make sure you know which one you're looking at. It will say low mark on there. And in contrast to the one that we've just seen, this one is a very weak learner who has um, hit band one or two for the majority of the work. This learner achieved 23 out of 60. For task one, they got four marks. So in comparison to the one that we just saw, you'll notice here that that's very limited. They've hardly written anything about Billy's um, language development. The part about the growth is a bit better. Um, they've put a chart in, but they haven't really explained it. They've just shoved that picture in there, make it look nice. <clears throat> And the principal moderator's commentary is saying that mark band two is the best fit. It's at the lower end of, of that mark band because some of it's in mark band one, but there was a bit of it in mark band two. So they've decided to go with four, which is the bottom of mark band two. And again, the moderator here has used that terminology, detailed account, superficial account, to help you see how those marks have been applied. <clears throat> Some of these tips, I've already covered some of these, but make sure that they're looking at the correct age group because um, sometimes um, in some of these examples for the low mark ones, you'll see they've gone off writing about the wrong thing and that's why they're not getting the marks. 
Um, again, a lot of this is rep uh, repetition that I've already said to you. Use the words in bold on the marking grids um, to help you. So we get, hopefully you get the idea. And then there's also, I'm not going to open this one up because I want to show you component two as well. There's also a middle one. So you've got a top, middle and a bottom for component one. And the same for component two. So I'm just going to pause and look at the questions. Yes, Patricia, this is an example that an adult wrote. Um, just in case you were looking at that thinking, whoa, this is good. <laughs> um, it is. And as I explained at the beginning, we don't have any real examples yet until um, we've gone through a moderation. Jenny, is it mandatory that we annotate? No, Jenny, it's not. And I'll come on to that later. How much feedback do we have to give, Tony? I'm going to be doing that in a, in a slide that's coming up. So just bear with me. Um, Sharon, that's a really interesting question. Um, Sharon's asking why we don't have the same level of depth for health and social care. And I noticed that myself, Sharon, because I'm a moderator for both. And I'm really sorry, but I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, it does seem a little bit inconsistent. Um, the simple answer is that these qualifications have different teams and different um, senior moderators. However, what I can say with health and social care is that more will appear next year. If this is something that you want to feed back to Pierce and Sharon, then, you know, please feel free to do that. But as I said, I have noticed that myself um, as well. OK, so that's um, component one. I'm going to move on and show you, um, again, component two is very similar, um, but we'll just have a quick whiz through that one as well. Hopefully I've managed to control my coughing, <laughs> I do apologise. So this is the piece and set assignment for component two. So again, it's set out in a similar way. Um, same rules apply. You must use this one. You can't change it. Um, well, you must use the one that's for the window that you've entered. Similar format, similar in that each task will clearly tell you age groups or types of play that the students are supposed to be looking at. So this tells us that Hector is two, and it's asking the students to write about these um, different player experiences. <laughs> it's saying that they wish it to be set out like an article. 12 marks, again, suggested time. And then we get task two. Plan an activity, it tells them the age, it tells them it's in the home environment. And these things are very important because if they plan something that couldn't be done in the home, they're not going to get the marks. The activity must be child initiated and it must be for cognitive play. And then task three um, is, is slightly different. This is for a small group of children in a nursery and it, they want it to be adult-led and physical play. So as you can probably guess, <laughs> these will change each series. So, you know, next time they might be asked to write about um, a different setting and a different age group. <clears throat> Here are the mark bands, so I'm not going to go through these in loads of depth because it's, it's the, the same principle applies. But as I've said, please remember you're using the correct one for the correct component and the correct task because it could be easy to get that muddled up. And you'll see here some slightly different terms used 
um, to component one, because we've got here little relevance and little accuracy, partially accurate, etc. But the same approach of the words are in bold, decide your mark band first, and then decide your number of marks. And again, we've got a grid for task two and a grid for task three. Okay, I'm just going to check the box. Oh, someone was just saying thank you. That's fine. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the examples for this. Again, you get a top, middle and a bottom full piece of work. They're all on the website. I think I just need to go back to the website and then um, download these because it wasn't opening up from my desktop before. <laughs> And actually, you've just seen there how I have um, downloaded them from the website and how easy it is to do that. Oh, but I've come back into um, component one again. Sorry. So shall we look at there? Start with the bottom one this time. So we'll look at the low mark for component two. Again, they all look the same, so make sure you're on the right one. Um, and this tells you it's the low mark. Component two is out of 60. This person only got 16. They got four marks um, for task one. So they've written about solitary and parallel play, but it's quite, quite weak. Um, they've written about some activities here. But if you look at what the principal moderator is saying, um, they think that the standard of work is limited knowledge. They're not showing a good understanding of the ages and stages of play. Their account is partially detailed, partially relevant. Um, they've given an appropriate activity for construction, but the links given to the age and stage of development are only partially accurate. So this is why it's really important that they understand the age that they're looking at to be able to get in. They're not going to get higher than a mark band one or maybe the bottom of two. Again, you've got some tips in here. Um, I'm not going to read them all out, but they, this one's quite important. There's no need to include all stages of play. It's just the ones that they're asked to do and they'll waste time um, and they'll, you know, waste they'll write things that are not relevant. They need to home in on what that brief is asking them to do. Here they've done task two. They've got um, four marks and a three marks, which should give them a seven. These are not very detailed activity plan. And although that looks detailed, it looks like they've written a lot. They've waffled on about something that's not what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so again, it tells you here um, why. So if we look at the bottom, the justification on the choice of activity is not relevant. So although they've written quite a bit, it's not, it's a bit of waffle. Um, and they've not really shown a good understanding. Okay. So we we you know we get the idea there, and again you need to read through these carefully yourselves, so that you um, understand what what you've seen and that you can see the comparisons between them. I'm going to go to the um, higher one now, the high mark, so we can see a contrast to that. This is telling us the learner got 52 out of 60. So this is someone who's done very well and they got 12 marks for their task one. So you can see how much has been written here. I'm just going to highlight that's what they've written about solitary play. And on the other one, they'd only written a sentence. So you can see here, they've shown a really good understanding. <clears throat> they've explained exactly what solitary play is. They've given some examples of what you might see. 
So a child putting a ball into a bucket. Um, and then they've talked about spectator and parallel play. And this is nice at the end. As Hector is two, you might just be coming out of solitary and moving on. So they're really homing into that case study and they're remembering that this is about Hector who's two. It's not just about any old child who's any age. And this is what's going to get them the full marks is really homing in. So when you're teaching, a good tip is to do lots of practicing of case studies. So, you know, you might teach something and then at the end of the lesson, you might want to give them a bit of a scenario of here's a child age three, what type of play would they be doing? And then it just gets them practicing at, at making sure they're playing it properly. So you can see here, this is a much more detailed piece of work, very clear headings. Again, they keep talking about Hector. Can you see they keep referring back to that child, acknowledging, you know, that Hector is the age that he is. And then you've got the moderator's commentary that explains exactly um, why it's being put in there. But I've sort of explained that as, as I've gone along. Um, some of these tips are quite repetitive across component one and two. So, you know, it's the same kind of tips. Make sure they focus on the age. They don't need to include everything. The learner's response doesn't have to meet all the characteristics of the mark band before being placed in that mark band. It's the best fit as long as it meets more characteristics of that mark band than of any other. So if you've got... Um, the majority of it's in band four and they've gone off a bit at the end and that bit's ended up in band three, you might still want to put it in band four, but at the lower end of band four, if that makes sense. Um, it's one of those things, I think, that once you start doing it, you get the hang of it and you'll, you know, once you start doing it, it'll be fine. Patricia, are we permitted to give the students the appendix for component one in advance. Yeah, you can give them it as soon as that window opens, Patricia. So as soon as that, um, I'll give you the dates later, as soon as that window opens, that, appear, that brief appears on the website and you can give it out um, as soon as it's there, yeah. Okay, so I'm now just going to go back to the PowerPoint. Sorry, I think I closed it down by mistake, so I need to get back to where I was. <laughs> okay, so as I've kept saying, those materials are all on the website now. And you can download them at any point and have a look at them. <laughs> okay, so we've quite got quite a bit more to cover. So this slide is about resubmission of evidence and retakes, which is something that we get lots of questions about. So learners can have a resubmission. So the way it works is they do their work and you're going to mark it. And after you've marked it, if you think that a learner <clears throat> could have done better because they're not working at the standard you're expecting from them, you can give them that resubmission. But that resubmission has to take place before moderation. So when you look at the time frames later on, you need to make sure you allow time for that just in case that's going to happen. There's no longer a requirement to have a lead IV to sign off a, a resubmission or anything like that. That's your decision as a teacher if you want them to do it or not. And this is where the feedback comes in. And some of you were asking about feedback and I am going to cover it. Um, later on another slide, but we still need to give feedback that's not too leading, just in case we are going to give that moderation, uh, give that learner a resubmission. So um, 
you can write things like, well done, you've got this many marks and you were in band four because you provided a good account or a comprehensive account so you can use those words in bold from the mark grids. But you, what you can't do is tell them what to do. So you can't say, you're in band three. To gain band four, you should have written about this and this and this and this and tell them exactly what to do because you're giving them an unfair advantage if they have a resub. So they can have a resub and depending, um, one question that I'm always asked is, can they have the full six hours for the resub? They can if you really wanted them to. I don't think it's likely they'll need that because it might be there's just one bit of it they're going to resub. It might just be the task three. So you can give them however much time you want up to that six hours. So you could give them the full six or you could give them two or three, but you have to make sure that you fit that into the window. So it's keeping your eye on those time scales. So you've marked the work. You may give somebody a resubmission. You may give a few learners a resubmission. That's absolutely fine. And then you have your, your final marks. And those are the marks that you submit to the moderator. You do not have to um, submit two lots of marks to the moderator. You do not have to say, right, this learner got 30 and then they had a resubmission and the second time they got 40, you just submit the final mark. Once that's happened, once those moderator marks have been submitted, and I'm going to be taking you through that whole process um, before we finish today, you do, cannot change them and you cannot give a, a resubmission after that point. So once those marks have gone in on an Excel online, there are no more resubmissions. However, they can have a retake if you really wanted them, them to. However, because we are, because this, this qualification is now compensatory, we're expecting there to be very few retakes. And the reason for that is if they don't do very well, they've got chance to compensate elsewhere because now they can actually get a U on one of these components and still do okay if they pass the others. And that wasn't the case in the 2017 version. So um, if they've done the work and you've given, whether you've given them a resubmission or not, and the moderator marks have gone in, and then after that, you decide that you want them to have another go, they would have to be entered in the next window with a completely different brief, and they would have to do it all again. So hopefully that makes sense. You have got that opportunity just in case, but we're not really expecting it to be used very much. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Here we've got the um, assessment windows. And I know that I think it was Tony who said that um, she had entered them for this window and that's absolutely fine. So we are what I call flat bang in the middle now of that first window. Um, and the window works where um, early October, the um, Pearson set assignment is released. There's another date prior to that that you have to enter them by. And I'm going to be showing those dates on another slide at the end. So you that. Uh, assignment appears on the website and as soon as it's on there you can download it and you can look at it you can give it to the learners you can also look at it if you're not entering them in that window October to December they seek the internal assessment at a time and a date that is your centre's choice we don't care what day you do it on. It's got nothing to do with Pearson. It's up to you and the logistics of managing that in your centre. However, you need to be aware that the final um, deadline for the marks is the 15th of December. So you have, so obviously it's not a good idea to be doing this um, assessment on the 14th of December because you're no way going to have time to mark them all and give people a resubmission. So make sure you allow yourself enough time and you can do it whenever you like within that window. And the 
submission of marks must be uploaded by the 15th of December. Um, and that you must have done your resubmissions by that point. Also in this window, there will be an external assessment for component three, but not until 2024, because component three is synoptic, it's designed to be done at the end of the qualification, it's designed to be done after components one and two, so no one can do that exam until the January of 2024. And then in the March, there's a results window. So um, probably if you're used to exams, you will know that, um, you know, we'll say exams are marked. In March, you get the results and you get the lead examiner report. That now works in a similar way for the internally assessed components. So once moderation has taken place, in March, you will get the results, and it is at that point that you will know if your learner's got a pass, merit, or distinction. And a moderator's report will be published on the website that will have the grade boundaries. And just like an exam, those grade boundaries can change each window. They can go up or down by um, one or two marks. So if a, a certain number of marks has been given a level two pass in March, it might be a different, um, slightly different in the August window. So can you see how that's working now in a much fairer way in the way that um, exams would work? We've also got the next window, which we're calling the um, May and June window, so that you have an opportunity um, to see that PSA, that Pearson set assignment in February. The learners do the work between February and April. Please be mindful there of when your Easter holidays are falling um, because they can actually mess up your plans. Also be aware of when May Day falls because we get a bank holiday. Sometimes that can fall on the 1st of May. So you've got all that to factor in as well. Um, and the deadline to submit the marks is the May the 1st. So again, make sure you allow your time for resubmissions and marking. And you know, you're not going to be doing it on the 29th of April or the 30th of April because you will have time. Again, when component three is up and running, there'll be a May window for that. And then all of those results will come in August on the traditional date for our um, GCSE results day. Okay, so just sort of um, let that sink in. It's very important that you stick to the dates. You will be penalised for, um, you'll have to pay for late, late um, entries. But with submissions, th there's no leeway with that. Those marks have to go on by the 15th of December or the 1st of May. If they don't, then you will have no um, option other than to put your learners back into the next window. So really important that you're aware of those. Okay, so I'm going to take you now through the full moderation process. Before I do that, I'm just going to check the chat. Um, Tony, if you give out the um, thing as soon as the window opens, doesn't this mean the students could write the notes? Um, possibly, but it's not, I mean, obviously, Pearson have taken this in, into consideration and they're not going to, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think about sort of what, you, what, you'd be, what you'd be worried about here. Yeah, I suppose you're right, but, you know, they're not, are they going to do that? You know, are they going to, they, they can take in um, some notes with them. But if if they're going to start writing their notes, everyone in the country could start doing that. So it, it's a bit sort of swings and roundabouts. This pe people have got, will, can be given it on the same day 
as everybody in the country, if that makes sense. Yes, when you've entered the grades, the um, learner's work will be chosen, but it's not chosen by the moderator, Tony, it's chosen by a system, and I'm covering that now, so hopefully all your questions will be answered. Okay, so we've, we've, we've marked the work, we've given any resubmissions, and we've got a final set of marks for our group, okay? What we have to do with those marks is we have to put them in a rank order. So the learner who got 60 or 58 or 59 will be at the top, all the way down to the one who's at the bottom. And then we input the marks on Edexcel Online. And your exams officers um, in your schools will have information get through on how to do that. Um, and how to use, um, they should also how to use, know how to use um, Edexcel Online. So you upload all the marks and then the system will choose a, a selection of learners and that's one of the reasons why you need to rank them so the system can choose a mixture of top, middle and bottom marked learners. The sample size is shown at the bottom so if you've got a very small cohort of less than 10 students, all there'll be no system selection. They'll just all be chosen. Between 11 and 100, will, 10 will be chosen. 101 to 200 learners, it will be 15. And if you've got 200 plus learners, firstly, my hat goes off to you. <laughs> but secondly, you would it would be 20. Can you see there? Um, if the requested sample does not include the highest and lowest marks achieved, then um, those learners will need to be uploaded in addition. So um, it's taken me a bit of time to go ahead around that. I think if the system selects 10, but it doesn't select the person who got 60 or the person who only scored three, you may have to upload a couple of additional pieces of work, but don't worry about that because everything will you'll be it will clearly be explained to you um, what you need to do. Um, the learner work. So so let's say now we've gone through the process. You've got um, between eleven and hundred learners. So the system's chosen ten. There will then be an alert on Edexcel Online which will show your exams officer which 10 learners have been chosen. And then you must upload the work for those 10 learners only. You do not need to upload all the work for every single learner if you've got more than 10. <clears throat> if the work has been handwritten, you'll need to scan it. If the work has been um, word processed, then hopefully you've saved that on your systems, wherever you're going to save that. And you will need to upload the work with an assessment record sheet, which I'm going to go through in depth on another slide, which is just the marking sheet, which has the learner's name on, and you've given them some feedback on there, and you've given them their mark. Some of you may have used the learner work transfer system already because we've been using it as SVs for a couple of years. It's like an electronic Dropbox type thing where you it's very easy to upload that work. You absolutely must use the learner work transfer system. You have no other option. And I will admit, as an SV last year, I did accept work in a different way. I wanted to support people who were struggling with the learner work transfer system and I accepted work on a OneDrive or a Google Classroom. Some SVs have been known to accept that work by email or even by post, but we cannot do that. And, and the main issue is it's a huge GDPR issue and it goes against that GDPR guidance and you will have policies about that in your schools so you cannot email it you cannot send it in any other way it absolutely must be uploaded onto that system i must admit i didn't have any issues with that system um 
as an SV or because I'm still working in a centre, um, in a large FE centre where I submitted many samples for a range of qualifications and we had no issues with it. However, saying that, I have come across people who said they have had an issue with it. So the first thing that you need to do is make sure you know how to use that system. And when you get this PowerPoint through, that blue text learner work transfer, if you click on that, it takes you to a link to the YouTube video that shows you how to use it. It is honestly, it's really simple. You just upload the work. You need to make sure that you label it clearly with the learner's candidate number, not their name, because it's a GDPR thing again, um, and you should have their candidate numbers from the system, and you'll need to upload the work and the marking sheets, and there is a deadline for that to be uploaded by. Then the system sends that work so the, uh, gives them, well, they don't send it, they give the moderator access to that system so then they can see that work. So if I was your moderator, I will open up my system and I will have your school, I might be moderating work for five different schools, your school will be there, I will click on it and I will have that work already there. I will not be choosing the names, hopefully that makes sense. If you forget to upload something, if, you know, if you forget that um, you forgot to put the sheet on or something, there will be opportunities after where moderators can come back and say, actually, I think there's a page missing from this. Can you upload it? So there, there will be an opportunity um, for that there. And then what will happen is the moderator will do their moderation. So I will look at that work. And I will almost second mark it. I will look at it against that marking grid and I will decide if I agree with your marks or not. And there's two, well, there's a number of situations there, isn't there? There's one where I could say, yes, you're spot on. I agree with every single mark that you've given. I could be saying, I agree mostly, but um, you're a little bit out. However, we're always in the same mark band, so it's okay. The worst case is that you're way out on everything and you're in a different mark band. And it, if it changes the rank order, so this is another reason why we need to do the rank order. If we end up in a situation where the person that you gave 60 marks to is now at the bottom and some of the people that you were giving quite low marks to are now at the top, that would indicate that your mark is very, very inconsistent. And at that point, we would may ask to see some more work. And remember that the, all this is a supportive process. So it isn't the moderator coming to tell you off and tell you that you've done it wrong. Um, you know, these moderators are here to help you and support you. And if, if they don't agree with you, they will help you to get it right. So we don't need to be worrying about any, any of that. OK, um, so what we've got on here is just a note that if you wanted to do this, you can enter both internal components at the same time. I'm not sure any of you will be doing that, but if you want to do component one and two together, you can. And we try and keep you with the same moderator. And we can't always promise that because unfortunately moderators get ill or they hand their notice in and they, and, they, and they leave Pearson but we will try wherever possible to keep you with that same moderator for component one and two and to keep you with that same moderator for a couple of years if we are able to do that. Oops, just trying to move the slide on. Nothing to be playing. So this is what happens next. So once the moderator, so I'm your moderator, I've checked your marks, I've looked at if I agree or not. I am now going to make an appointment to contact you um, to give you a little bit of feedback, okay? I need to be honest with you, there's a little bit of a debate going on at the moment about whether or not we will contact you if we agree everything. So if I've looked at your work and it's spot on, 
and the marks are exactly the same mark that I would have given, you're probably not going to need a phone call or a meeting to talk about that. It'll just be a well done, it's spot on. So there's a bit of a debate going on about that at the moment. However, if we do feel we need to give you some feedback, the moderator will contact the quality nominee. So make sure you know who that person is and they'll say, that will probably be by email and they'll say, you know, I've done the moderation. I'd like to speak to your <clears throat> programme lead or assessor now to give a bit of feedback. And that can be done on the telephone or it can be done over a Zoom or a Microsoft Team call. We will not come and visit the centre. And also that feedback will be very brief. It will not be, you know, the, we won't be naming learners in there, for example. We won't be saying, right, on, on this piece of person's piece of work, this is what we thought. It'll be much more generic. It'll be, right, on task two, we think that perhaps you were marking a little bit too high and you put lots of things in mark band four, but I felt it was more of a mark band two. It'll be that kind of um, conversation that, that you're given. And... We need to stress that when we do give you that feedback, we only need the assessor. We absolutely do not need a full team of people there with SLT and the HEC teacher um, because that's not appropriate. It's not a formal meeting like that. It's a bit of a chat between the moderator and yourselves and it's there to support you. Um, and I'm just saying that because I know what some SLT can be like in schools and, and you know, we don't need it to take that form. Um, we will talk to you if we don't agree with your marks. We will talk to you about that. Um, and in rare cases, you know, if there is a massive difference and you're outside those mark bands, then and it, and it changes that rank order, then we may request that further samples are uploaded to the learner work transfer system. Okay, so following, following the moderator feedback. So if I've given you some feedback and I've said, um, right, I, I, I agree mostly, you were a couple of marks out a couple of times, but you stayed within the mark band. Or if I've said, actually, you were way out and, you know, I've given these, some of these pieces of work, um, put me mark band two when you said it was mark band four, you will have two weeks to amend your initial marks. If you wish to, it's very, very um, strange that that phrase is used because I always get questions at this point of what do you mean if I wish to? Do I have to change them? You don't have to change them if they are only slightly out and they stay in the same mark, they're in the same mark band and the rank ordering doesn't change. However, it's in your best interest to change them, especially if you're way out, because if you don't, it will come back to haunt you later on. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but technically, a moderator cannot say to you, you must change these marks. If you say, actually, I'm not going to change them, you don't have to. But, you know, why, why would you not? If you've got a major issue with your moderator and you really don't agree with them, and you want to complain or you want to put in an appeal, you can do that and there's a process for that. Um, so if you want to amend the marks, there's then a two-week window. So if the, if the moderator said you were slightly out and you want to put the marks up or down in line with what they've said, you've got to do it within that two-week window, otherwise it's too late. And then what happens next is um, any feedback and amendments are made. So you may input your second lot of marks if you're changing them. Your moderator will look at those against their marks and then they will finalise their written moderator report, which will be published on edXM Online on Results Day. And that report will be very brief um, 
it will nowhere near be as detailed as an SV report. Um, I must admit, I got a bit of a surprise when I saw one because um, it was like, whoa, it is very, very simple evaluative statements um, that does not go into any detail at all. So it'll be things like, um, in general, this centre's marks were in line with the moderator's marks. However, there were um, a minority of occasions where the marking was slightly out. It'll be something along those lines. Also on results day, they will be provided a national report in the same way that we do for exams, which will tell you the great boundaries and it will tell you where learners did well or where they didn't do so well across the country. And it will have extracts of work in there, the same as an exam would do. So it might say, you know, learners across the country did generally very well on task one. Here's an example of a learner who got full marks on that one. Here's an example of a learner who only got three. So you get the idea if you've seen those um, examiner reports before. If the final centre marks are reasonably accurate, they will be awarded. If the centre marks are not, um, they will be adjusted by the Pearson system in line with national standards. So this is why it's in your best interest to change those marks if, you, if you're advised to. Um, and again, um, if the rank ordering needs, we need to try and maintain that. So if, if that's out, that's that's where we get the problems. There is um, a video at the bottom here. So you remember when I said that if you um, click on these when you get the PowerPoint, it will take you to a video which basically sums up everything that I've just said in a very um, two or three short minutes. And um, you can get on there and have a look at that. I'm not sure this applies to any of you online today, but it's very important that we talk about centres who are working in a consortia. Um, so you may be working in, um, I know that many schools are in a multi-academy trust now, and you may be working with other schools. You might not be sampled across all the schools. So if you're a consortia, um, you've got one centre number. And if you've got, 20 learners um, in one school and 20 in another. It could be that one centre's learners are not sampled because they'll all go in the same rank ordering and the system might not choose from both centres. That makes sense. So it's very important that if you are in that situation, you do some you look at the standardisation materials together with the person from the other school or schools to make sure that you're all singing from the same sheet and that you make sure that you're all um, looking at the works. Because if, if, if the moderator's on the sample 10 and you are way out, then it is in your best interest to go and look at the whole cohort, not just the 10 that the moderator looked at. So you might need to look across the consortium if the other school wasn't seen. And in that situation, one person will need to take responsibility for, they're not like, it's not an official lead IV, but they will need to be the, take responsibility for receiving the feedback and passing it on to the other centres. So this possibly doesn't apply to you, but I need to make sure I cover it just in case. Okay, I'm going to just stop to do the questions. Um, people are asking me about dates. Um, I'm going to cover those again at the end um, and I'm going to give you a link to where the calendar is. Do we put the final mark out of 60 on the learner's work or just on the tracker too? Again, I'm going to cover that um, can you just bear with me because that's going to be covered on the upcoming slides. How soon after the 15th will the work be called for moderation? Because we break up on the 16th for the Christmas holiday. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
I'm going to just come back to that, Sharon, when I look at the dates on the next slide, if that's okay. And someone will be asking about that. Do you put the rank order when entering the final match? Yeah, it will ask, Ed Excel will ask it to be submitted in the rank order. So sorry, because I didn't answer every question there, but I will answer them on the next slide. I just don't want to keep repeating myself, if that's okay. Okay, so this is the slide where we celebrate the reduction in admin and paperwork on this qualification. Um, so um, what uh, Pearson have taken the opportunity through the redevelopment of the Tech Awards to streamline the quality assurance process and they have significantly reduced the admin required for you to deliver and assess these programmes and they've got the top there I'm not quite sure how they've worked this out, but they are saying that your admin is reduced by 65%. So there is no longer a need to set or internally verify assignments because they've been replaced by the Pearson set assignments. So hooray. Um, moderation replaces standard verification. This will result in a reduction in admin and forms. So there's no need to be messing around with an assessment plan. You do not need an assessment plan. You do not need to show an assessment plan to anybody. Um, so hooray. Um, no need to register a lead IV. Hooray. No need to do an IV plan. No need to do any IV. Hooray to that. You can actually, as I said, do a bit of unofficial IV if you wanted to, but nobody's going to check that. No Oscar standardisation. The moderation is um, much more straightforward than the SV. There's no what I call assessment plan ping pong, where you e emailing in that over to your SV, you, the, you email him again to tell you that it's changed and that goes on for several months. If all that sounds a bit too good to be true, um, you can see that in writing if you click on the link when you get your PowerPoint quality assurance homepage, which explains all that. And it also explains a bit more about the moderation process um, if you wanted to read that again. Um, and then just on the screen there, we've got a little bit of a tick list which just shows you the reduction there. With So all the ticks of what you had to do on the... Um, 2017 Legacy Tech Award. Now compare that to what you have to do on the Tech Award 2022. Um, so it is a bit a big difference there. Um, and, and you know, I personally think that that's that's a really um, one of the positives of this qualification to the staff because you all work very hard. And if we can reduce your workloads, that's always going to be a bonus. Okay, so lots of questions that you've already been asking me about marking. Um, there's two, there, there's a choice here of what you do when you're marking, and I'm going to go through both of these choices so that you can make a decision of how you want to do it. So we have provided you an assessment record sheet. This is on the website, and I can show you where to find it at the end. So this is a sheet that could be printed and you could write into it or you can save it electronically. Um, either way is fine. And this is technically a feedback sheet. So for each component, for each learner, you could use one of these. And obviously it's got your um, student's name and assessor name and everything on the top there that you would expect to see. And then it's got space for recording the marks for each task. So you would write on there, task one, 12 marks, task two, 18 marks, task three, whatever you've given task three, and add up those marks so that the learner can see um, how many marks have been given. You've then got a general comments box where you can give some feedback generically you know, well done, this was a really good piece of work. You've had a total of 50 marks. Um, you can use, this is where you can use some of that, um, some of that wording from those mark bands. So words like good, comprehensive, superficial. If they haven't done very well, you can say your work was very limited. 
And that's what I like to call the safe feedback because in, in case they're having a resub, <clears throat> it's not giving them too much help um, and not giving them an unfair advantage. You can comment on spelling and grammar and presentation if you want to, you know, well done. The spelling and grammar was really good throughout your work or you need to take care with your spelling because you kept, you know, making mistakes or you, you could have presented your work nicely. All that stuff you always do, you, you can do that. And you can annotate in their work. It's not a requirement, but, you know, it's good practice for um, Ofsted and for, you know, the, the, the other stuff that you're doing in your schools. So it's good practice to highlight their spelling and grammar. It's good practice to put a tick and a good. Um, you can, if you want to, you can write things, this is a good account, this is a superficial account, this is a comprehensive account. But what you can't do is give them specific feedback like, you know, you haven't written enough here, you should have written about this and this and this and this. Um, you can put things like, you know, if they've written about the wrong age group or the wrong area of development, you can write something like, um, please go back and check the brief carefully. So that's giving them a hint of, you know, you've not read it properly without telling them you've written about physical and you should have been written about writing about something else. So you can annotate, but it's not a requirement that you do it. Um, it can help the moderator if you annotate, because if you've written things like this is good, this is superficial, this is comprehensive, it gives them a bit of an idea of where you're coming from and they know um, to help you where you've gone wrong if your marks are out, but you don't have to do that. And then you would sign the form, date the form, exactly as you would do on um, the legacy qualification. And then to go with that is that grid that you can see that would be on A4 or print it on A3 or bigger if you want it to, that you could print out. And then what you could do on there is if you were printing it, you could highlight it. So can you see at the top, Matt Van Fors highlighted yellow. Imagine someone's done that with a highlighter because they've said that the learner is in Matt Van Fors and they've given them 10. And then further down, um, you, you can do that for each one. Or you could highlight on the screen if you're doing it electronically. And that will help um, learners to see and the moderator to see exactly um, what, what you've done and why. So if you're using this option, you would use both of those two together. Two sheets for one learner or two documents if it's electronic. Somebody asked me in a previous event, what if I don't want to use this? What if I want to use my own marking form? You can do that if you want to. However, it must cover the same things that this one does. So it must have the learner's name, program title. It must have a mark for each task. I wouldn't want to invent something if, if this is already there. But if you absolutely insisted on using your own, then you can do. But what you might want to use is the um, tracker. I don't know if any of you have looked at this already. Um, it's on the website. I'm going to open it up now and I'm going to show it to you. And um, I, I do love a spreadsheet and um, I probably sound like I need to get a life right now. But that spreadsheet is the best spreadsheet I have ever seen in my life. And I've been on there, even though I'm not teaching this qualification, I've been on there having to play around with it because I think it's just absolutely marvellous and it can do lots of wonderful things. So I'm going to share that now and hopefully you will agree that it's as wonderful as I think it is. Okay, so at the end, when I show you the website, I'll show you where you can find this. Please be aware that you um, must download it and save it before you use it. 
because I had a couple of people trying to open it up and they were saying it wouldn't work. Don't try and use it straight from the website. Okay, so open it, download it, save it, and then you click into here, which is student records. So I've been having a little bit of a play around with this already in order to be able to demonstrate how it works to you. So it, it's got many of the benefits of a regular spreadsheet, but you put your learners' names in, you can put them in alphabetical order. Later on, you can actually put them in rank order so it can help you do your rank ordering. So there's a couple of fake students in here that have um, popped in today. Um, so just for a bit of fun. Um, Tony, your name was <laughs> just one that I just remembered, so I'm going to put Tony in. Um, at, so Tony's done component one. So you click into component one in that little box and up comes the grid. Um, and the reason I love this is because it just helps you with that best fit. So task one um, for component one. There's, there's a few scenarios here, isn't there? So let's say Tony's done really well. Well done, Tony. You've got him map band four and I'm giving you 12, yeah? So I've highlighted. You see how you can change these and you can highlight them. I, if I'm marking this work, I've highlighted all of those and I'm giving a 12. That's pretty straightforward. But sometimes you get something like this. It's not that straightforward, is it? Or you get something, you know, play about with it like that. And then that's when you have to make your best fit decisions. So you have to think, well, you know, they did quite well on that bit, and that would be a 10. That bit would have been a three. That bit might have been a four. And then you'd have to do sort of an average. You might get something like that, where they did really well and then just went off a bit with their reasoning. Um, and, you know, that might average out as we might say that, you know, all oh, that was a 12 and that was a three. But remember what I said earlier, if the majority of it's in Mark Band 4, we can put it in Mark Band 4, but we might put it at the bottom. So instead of it being a 12, it might be a 10. So let's stick with that and I'm going to give a 10. I can put my feedback in here. So I can say, well done, Tony. You've done a really comprehensive account. Da, 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 da. But your reasoning was a bit in the lower band. Well done, your spelling was really good, etc. Okay, so you get the idea. And then we're doing that for each of the... Um, learning names so I'm just going to whiz down this quickly I'm going to say that that one was a good solid mark band three and I'm going to give a nine and again I'm going to give some feedback on that task well done da, 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 da. and the next bit of task two I'm going to say that was a nine as well. And then the next bit was really good, and that was an 11. And the last bit wasn't so good, and she ended up with three. So I'm clicking on it, I'm putting my marks in there, and I'm putting in the feedback, um, get the idea. And then we go back to the records. And it's now put Tony's marks in and it's told us she got 42, which is 70% of the total mark. One of the questions we get asked about um, grade boundaries and not knowing if it's a pass or merit is what do we say to our parents at parents' evenings or our um, when we're doing our targeting for SLT and all that stuff that you do in schools? What we can do is talk about percentages. So instead of saying Tony's working at a pass or a merit or a distinction, because we don't know that, 
we can say she got 70% and that's the language that we can use. However, if we are talking this talk with parents and students, we need to make sure that they're aware it's provisional um, until moderation and you might not want to release marks until your moderation has taken place. So Tony's done that and then we do the same process for component two. Um, again, I'll just whiz that down that really quickly. Again, you know, you don't need me to show you everything. But you, you can put your, your marks and your feedback in. Well done, Tony. You've done really well. You're getting 12. Um, all the way down this one. But something's gone a bit wrong on the last task. And it's ended up a bit of a mess like that. So on that one, I'm going to go for an eight because he's sort of in the middle of all that. Okay, so we get the idea. Put in the feedback, go back. And um, Tony got 93% on that one, which was 56 out of the total mark. And here we can put the candidate numbers in. So if you wanted to use your spreadsheet magic, if you want this to be in candidate number order, alphabetical order, you can export bits of it. So you could copy and paste some of it onto another spreadsheet if you want to do put it in rank order. Um, and if you're using this, you don't need those other two sheets on that other slide because you would send this to your moderator and I'm your moderator now and I've got Claire and Tony's work in front of me. I'm going to click here and it's going to be absolutely clear to me how many marks Tony was given for this task and it's going to be absolutely clear to me what feedback was given. So you do not have to, when we talk about the 65% reduction in admin, you do not, ha do not have to use both of those things. And I hope you are as excited as me about this spreadsheet because I just think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I don't know whether you want to put your thoughts in the chat if you've already seen it or you think it's really good or if you think it's not very good, then, you know, do tell us. Um, but somebody in Pearson has devised this and they've actually done it for every single tech award i think it was the same person who did them all um i, I just think it's really really useful so hopefully you will like that and you will um be able to use it um oh somebody's had to leave because they've shut the school um the tracker is so good i have used it and i agree it's the best thank you um no, Tony, you cannot, absolutely not give them a target grade of PMRD. You cannot do that because you don't know. So if somebody gets 40 marks, you don't know if that's a PMRD until we've gone through the moderation. So it's a big change for you. What you can do is you can do some mock um, assessment if you have time using the, the example brief and what you can give the parents or the on the targets is a percentage. This learner got 50% or they got 93% or whatever. Does that make sense? The spreadsheet looks amazing. Yes, Karen, it is amazing. I absolutely love it. Um, I told you it was going to cut your work down by 65%. Is there a separate learner declaration as this doesn't seem covered in the spreadsheet? That's a really good question, Sarah. And I actually thought about that myself because there isn't anywhere for them to sign it. So that might be unfortunately one of the questions that I do have to go back and just double check with Pearson. But I think if you do need the declaration, it will simply be a signature because you've already done everything on here. So I'll try and find that out, um, but that's that's a really good question. So do download that. Remember what I said, you need to download it and save it before you can use it. 
have a play around with it. Um, and if you're going to do any mocks, again, you can use it for your mocks and that's can inform your targets and can inform your parents, your SLT on a percentage, not on a grade. And I can't stress the importance of that enough. They do not equate to grades. And even if, because let's face it, you know, if you've got a learner who's got 60 out of 60, you know that they've done very well. However, you still cannot say um, this is a distinction because you are just not allowed to do that anymore. Okay, I'll just quickly, um, because we have sort of got um, to the end, I'm just getting a reminder um, from the admin that we're nearly at the, at the, at the end. So what I'm going to do is just quickly whiz through um, the last couple of slides. We have gone slightly over, so I do apologise. But you will get this. Here are the dates in much more detail, which show the dates when you have to enter them by and that kind of thing. And then at the end, we've got um, where you can go for further support. So we've got a link to the page. We've got a link to um, Esther Trahern's email address. So she's your subject advisor. Many of you may be working with her already if you've got any further questions. And then um, with there is a link on here, if you're interested in becoming a moderator, um, you can apply and it's really good CPD and you get paid as well. So that's good. Um, we're always looking for good people like yourselves who may want to do that. Very, very quickly, and it will be quickly because I am running over um, the website, um, which I did open up earlier. So the website is, um, you know, it's a good idea to spend some time exploring around there. It's got everything that you will need in these tabs here. So the specification, sample assessments, teaching and learning material has the examples in there. Um, that we covered today and it also has, has the tracker in there as well. Sorry that was a little bit rushed um, towards the end and I do apologise for the bouts of coughing in between the um, training as well. Um, as I said, you will get the PowerPoint sent out to you. Um, if there's any final questions, if you want to just pop them um, into the chat. Otherwise, I wish you all a really um, pleasant evening and thank you very much for joining us online. Sorry, Kimberly's asking, will I be emailing the PowerPoint out? Yeah, the email, uh, I personally won't be emailing it, but it will come out to you in the next couple of days um, and it has links on there um, as well. So thanks very much, everybody. I wish you a really pleasant evening and thank you and good luck to you with your marking and good luck with your moderation. Thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you, Claire, for today's session, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We really hope you found it useful. Have a great day, and stay safe, everyone.